abbreviated. Okay, so right. Um, so action is guided by these kind of uh, strategic motivations for the acquisition of resources. And uh, uh, as I mentioned yesterday during the discussion, uh, to my view, intrinsic motivations are important because because uh, in situations where um, there are no resources around, for example, in the case of children uh, that play, um, instead of staying there waiting for sweet motivation to be around and to be acquired, uh, you can spend your time acquiring uh, knowledge and skills that can be later uh, useful for the acquisition of extreme resources, for example, when the child becomes an adult, or when there is a robot that uh, uh, one day has to solve some tasks and problems for the user, but he doesn't know them uh, while it's uh, autonomously developing. So, to me, the function of intrinsic motivation is to support autonomous learning when there is not an explicit task to solve. Okay. And uh, regarding action, uh, we have two types of actions, so actions that directly change the world, they can produce the words, and actions that have to do with uh, control of attention, and uh, they are there, uh, they cannot directly obtain extrinsic reward, but they can furnish information to manipulation, they can uh, then acquire the words, and this can, back, uh, can go back to uh, the, the attention on behavior. So you see that the, uh, there is a problem there uh, that we highlighted by this term of ecological active vision that uh, over attention per se cannot obtain rewards. It has to go through the support of the actual change of the world in order to produce rewards. That's a problem. That's an interesting problem. So uh, what I mean by intrinsic motivations? Mm, I explained the general function of intrinsic motivations. Uh, getting to the mechanism that you can use to implement them or to discover them in the brain uh, there are three types of intrinsic motivations. That's uh, our proposal and uh, our people too. Uh, there are uh, surprise intrinsic motivations, so uh, prediction-based intrinsic motivations, and they are based on the quality of the predictions of the model of the world, and they can be measured as error or rate of improvement of your predictions. Then there are novelty-based intrinsic motivations. They have to do with the fact that you store information in your memory, uh, and they, they can be detected or uh, measured in terms of quality or rate of improvement of memories. By detecting and measured, I mean a system that wants, that has, that intrinsic motivation has to rely on this kind of measures, okay? The third one is competence-based intrinsic motivations. They have to do with the accomplishment of some goals or tasks. And the system can measure uh, and can generate these intrinsic motivations on the basis of the probability of the increase of the probability of succeeding to accomplish the task or to go on. I'm going, uh, uh, I'm going to use this concept in, uh, in the models in the thinking. So the first model focuses on uh, these issues and in particular uh, how the strings and intrinsic motivations can be uh, supported by one biological signal, which is dopamine. Uh, regarding dopamine, there are um, um, dopamine has been described different functions. Two important ones are uh, reward prediction error, and this is useful for maximizing the rewards, for example, the accomplishment, the achievement of food, the income of food. And another proposal has more to do with intrinsic motivations, and it's, it's the idea that uh, dopamine is generated when uh, there is a, a sudden uh, visual or auditory event happening in the world, and uh, which is unexpected, and this drives the, the triggering of uh, dopamine, passive dopamine. So, uh, this evidence uh, raises two problems. The first one is that you need one signal to accurate two types of motivations, and uh, sorry, two, two types of motivations, and two types of signals, and the other problem is that the same signal has to train both uh, attention and manipulation engines. So, uh, we propose a model that has several, uh, I mean, we will constrain it at a high level on the basis of uh, biological evidence. Uh, for example, the fact that basal ganglion can learn uh, by reinforcement learning to, uh, to, try to drive uh, attention and also to drive manipulation. And we implemented it with uh, an actor critic model. Uh, for people who don't, don't know that, uh, the actor is the component of the system that can produce actions by trial and error, and eventually 
uh, thesis on some actions when there is a reward. And the critic is a component that um, can anticipate the future reward and on, the, on this basis can produce step-by-step uh, -step learning signal, signals to the actor. So, uh, this is the model that uh, we used to show how it is possible to integrate the true signals into one uh, biological element that is dopamine. So, um, in this model, there is a simulated robot that uh, has a foley and a vision that moves around, that it has a control to move around in order to look at food or a genetic structure. There is an arm can, that can reach food and then bring the food to the mouth. Okay? And here we have uh, intrinsic rewards related to the fact that the food reaches the mouth. The first intrinsic reward related to the fact that the system discovers some objects in the, in the sea or that it touches some objects with the hand. Okay? And then we have three versions of the model. One where we have only extrinsic rewards, one we have extrinsic rewards plus uh, rewards for touching or looking at objects. And then one where we have extrinsic rewards and intrinsic rewards that fade away <coughs> when they become predicted. And this is the, one of the important features of intrinsic motivation. One, uh, once you learn something, the motivation should fade away. So the learning signal should fade away. Uh, so they are transient, and that's very important. So here, uh, intrinsic rewards are non-transient, they remain for touching objects, for example. Here, they fade away once you predict the effects of your actions. Okay? So the three models that uh, use these three types of uh, reward signals uh, they have different performance in time. So uh, only the, the third system uh, has a high performance at the end, and the other two fails. Uh, the reason why the first system that is guided only by extrinsic motivation fails is that um, uh, it's not able to learn the long sequence of actions in order to find the food with the eye, reach it, bring it to the mouth. Because the system has to not only to compose these actions, but also to learn the very fine details of the actions themselves. So it starts to look around, move around with the arm, it's not able to solve the task. The reward is too far away. Uh, so intrinsic motivations can scaffold learning along the way, and uh, uh, so the second and the third system are better off, but only the third system learns, and the reason is that the first system basically discovers the destructor, which is in this case has a higher science. And starts to play with it and uh, never disengage from that because uh, the intrinsic motivation doesn't, sorry, the intrinsic reward doesn't fade away. And then the second system, where after some time the, the system has learned whatever it has to learn about the structures and so is bored about that and can explore other things like the food, only in that case the system can learn and uh, discover that it's possible to eat the food and get an extrinsic reward and so it solves the whole problem. So, um, this shows you that uh, it is possible to integrate one signal, uh, sorry, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation towards into uh, the, the one system. And uh, uh, this can be clearly seen here because uh, here we have the actor critic um, uh, control of the arm, of the eye, and we have the three uh, extrinsic and intrinsic signals that go to the same place, which is dopamine. And um, so this, this uh, unique component can uh, uh, collect all types of rewards, which are, by the, by the way, generated by different parts of the brain. It can uh, put them in the same kind of signal and then broadcast to all the whole brain. So both the attention arm controller and the, uh, and the arm controller. And uh, the reason why these two guys can learn in a nice way is as follows. So we have three phases, uh, one where the system learns to look, one where it learns to touch and grasp uh, the food, and then when it learns to transport. Uh, these phases were not um, hardwired by us, you can observe them uh, while the system learns by itself. And you can see that in the first phase, uh, uh, the intrinsic report for looking uh, allows the system to learn to find the food, for weight the food. In the second phase, the system uh, discovers that it can touch touch the food and that's uh, rewarding by itself and uh, here uh, the, the learning signal can uh, percolate, percolate to the attention component because the attention component is needed in order to touch and so also attention can learn and support the pragmatic action. In the third phase mm, the system can focus on uh, the extrinsic reward and
yeah, it's good to move randomly, so even if it receives reward, it's not a problem. Uh, it's similar to what happens in the first page when the system is learning to look and receives uh, rewards for looking, and uh, the arm is moving around randomly, it doesn't matter if it receives some rewards. So, even if the reward is, uh, invests the whole uh, system, model system, uh, the component of the parcel should learn, they learn, and the other ones are not disturbed by uh, non useful rewards. Um, that's another way that we need to show the particular types of predictors that we can use to implement these intrinsic motivations. Um, and the, uh, the idea here is that we discover that, uh, uh, we discover, we show in a systematic way that uh, prediction-based intrinsic motivations are not very good for uh, implementing mo uh, intrinsic motivations in this kind of setup where you have, you have to acquire competence, so learning to do things. And the reason is that, uh, I'll give you an example to explain. Uh, imagine you have to learn to go on the bike. If you uh, get bored about learning to go on the bike because after you learn to predict that you fall, and you stop exercising, it's not good. So your um, prediction system might become very good because you are very good in predicting that you will fall off the bike. But this doesn't mean that you are able to drive the bike. So you should disengage with uh, uh, trying to learn to drive the bike only when you are actually able to succeed in accomplishing your task. And so these are competence-based intrinsic motivations. And another feature that we discover is that not only you have to uh, focus on the success of your action, not on the fact that you have a good model of the world uh, full stop. And uh, uh, on the input side, uh, you shouldn't uh, consider standard kind of predictors uh, getting stated action as input, but uh, predictors that get task and goals, task or goals as input, because what you want to do is actually have an information but you are good in solving a task. So, uh, in conclusion is that word signal or intrinsic and intrinsic motivations can be supported by, uh, can, sorry, can support uh, learning of long action sequences, and the trans transient nature of uh, intrinsic motivations avoid uh, interference with long-term rewards because they fade away. And competence-based intrinsic motivations are better than uh, prediction based on other TVs to guide the selection of the activity uh, with which to engage. And then I wrote, uh, one reward signal for attention manipulation is okay because uh, attention can be directly uh, driven by intrinsic motivations and when intrinsic rewards come in, these rewards are uh, produced by manipulation of the world, but they can percolate down to the attention system and furnish the proper information to, for manipulating the world. So now I get to the second model, and I've, uh, I focus more as we on to the attentional part, in particular showing how it is important to differentiate between top-down um, um, and uh, bottom-up attention components. And um, we go to this, uh, this approach in which we develop the model, the Active Vision. Uh, the word comes from Active Vision produced by Ballard. And the idea that the system uh, should have a uh, high sensitivity fovea and look around the environment with that fovea instead of you know, getting the whole visual information of the world because that's too much information. So uh, one advantage of that is that you can reduce information uh, to process. And also you have uh, the possibility of exploiting the fact that you uh, identify the location of things in the world and you can act according to that. And one problem, uh, but these basic some problems, so there's some large those problems. Uh, one problem is that there are many many elements to look at in order to decide what to do. And so uh, you have to produce subcardic sequences. And another problem is that attention in an ecological situation Attention uh, cannot directly produce uh, extensive reward, it has to go through manipulation. So, attention can furnish good information, and good information can eventually produce rewards and this can feedback and drive the learning of the attentional system. So, the second model is about that. Uh, so, we have a robotic setup with a camera that looks down uh, a computer screen, and there is a robotic arm. And uh, these are the types of stimuli that the system sees in the screen. So basically there are green cues, they can be everywhere, so you can try out a different situation, but there are some regularities. So the red target is always at the left of a green cue, and there are some instructors around. 
Okay, so the, the task of the system is to uh, foliate this uh, target and, and reach it. Uh, imagine that this brings, uh, I mean, procures food to the system. Okay. How long? Five minutes, ten minutes, two thirty-five. Okay. Uh, so um, the bottom component is uh, kind of hardwired in the sense that. It's based on the information the system is attracted in the sea, it's attracted by uh, high contrast situation, for example, or movement. Whereas the top down component, uh, as before, is based on ectopedic, so it can learn to look around depending on the current task. That's an important point. Uh, in addition, the system has, uh, with respect to the previous one, to the end, uh, the pointers, um, as a, a potential action map component. That, uh, with respect to before, can store the biases to look around. So the information, the, the vote, voting for looking around by the uh, top-down component, they can accumulate into memory. So uh, this brings advantage, as we will see. And also, uh, the system, the reaching is figured if the system looks at the same point for some times. Okay. So uh, this, the, the actual component is simplified in this. Model. And there is a cost for uh, um, the movement of the arm, so assuming there is an energy cost there. So the system is basically as the one, sorry, as the one before, but uh, so there is a bottom up and uh, bottom up and the top down component. This can learn, the top down component can learn, and information is uh, where to look is accumulated to this kind of memory, the prediction action map. And this can eventually trigger a, a movement, a rich movement to an item. If uh, the system looks at it for three times at least, so uh, the system has a, which is a high performance of getting the food. Uh, if you relatively few trials, considering the variability of the environment, and these are the typical sequences of circuits that we can observe. So, for example, here, first the system focuses on a high silent CQ and then it directly uh, targets on the on the directly focus on the target, and at least some case uh, triggers the rich movement. Or here it focuses on uh, uh, the structure and then goes back to the queue and then to the uh, target, and this is the frequency of the sequences. And uh, how are these clever sequences produced, circuits, exploration circuits produced and learned? So here we can see the representation of the biases of the top the, the top-down uh, component as learned uh, with enforcement learning. And you can see that uh, in a typical sequence, uh, the structure Q structure target. Uh, when the system observes the queue, it, uh, um, this picture, the white thing is that it has a strong bias to the left of the queue and not to stay on the queue themselves. This is eye-centered uh, representations. When it follows the destructor, uh, because for example it went there, by chance went to the destructor, it has a strong bias to look north or south. Why? Because there is a high probability that the uh, queue is up or is uh, north or south. When it follows the, the target, uh, it has a high, um, a sense of high probability to stay in the place to trigger the pragmatic action. And uh, uh, this is the bias from the top down component, this is the prediction action map, sorry, the, the potential action map that accumulates information in time. For example, here you can see that when it's on the target, it remembers that it shouldn't go to the high silency uh, queue on the right because it's uh, no more useful now and uh, the focus should be kept here. And that comes from the memory from observing the queue before. And so, uh, summarizing the interesting bits of this model uh, and the general bits will be learned from it. Ecological uh, condition uh, needs sequences of saccades to be solved, and uh, the fact that enforcement learning is able to backpropagate uh, reward signals is an important aspect. If this is added to this potential action map that remembers where uh, is uh, important to look at. Then there is um, this idea of the, that's very important, the interplay of the bottom up and top down component. In particular, we saw more uh, several times that uh, uh, very important features where the bottom up proposes places where to look, but depending on the task, uh, the top down system learns to allow for that or to override it. Say, no, no, this is not interesting, I'm going to limit this bottom up tendency. And that's a very powerful way to. Speed up learning. We'll see another example of that later uh, on. For IR coordination, um, the idea is that attention.
potential to process information, but YARN is able to use that information to probe the environment. And not if the, uh, this leads to reward, then the attentional behavior is rewarded and consolidated. Otherwise, it's override uh, and change. Mm, okay, I don't have much time, just taking to the fact that this general model can be applied to uh, account for developmental psychology experiments. And this is a general approach that we tend to have. So to try to build general models and then you can apply them to different uh, experiments. Because too often in our community, you have one experiment, you build one problem, oh, sorry, one model, you throw away the model, you go to another experiment, you get another model, and so on so forth, so you don't have cumulativity. Whereas we try to aim for these uh, models that are quite general, and so it can be used to account for different experiments. This was one example of uh, how we account for the mental psychology experiment. Again, I have to fly it, because time is passing. So it's based on the base contingency paradigm, there is a child that looks at the screen, and uh, when it uh, looks at a particular base in the screen, an eye tracker causes a change in the screen itself. Specific example, the child looks at this red button, an image appears. And uh, uh, in this work, uh, Thiersch and other researchers show that the children very rapidly learn to uh, saccade to the red button in order to reduce the appearance of the image. And uh, they, uh, also, they, after some time, they learn to anticipate um, the appearance of the image, so that the report image is going to appear. So, two patients. How do they learn so fast in three or four experiences, three or four trials? And what are the mechanisms for the emergence of this anticipation? And uh, we, are, we, we, we gave an answer to these patients on the basis of uh, the model we saw before. So, basically, the one on the left, on the left is a uh, a sub-part of the model we saw before. So, in this particular case, we only consider the bottom-up or top-down component. We eliminated the arm because it was not needed in this experiment. We eliminated the potential action map because it was even not needed here. And uh, uh, the system uh, uh, allows to reproduce the fact that after some time, uh, that very quickly the system learns in three or four times to suck in the, the red button to obtain the, the appearance of the image and uh, also learns to anticipate, uh, mm, to anticipate uh, the appearance of the image itself. And uh, the reason why the system works so fast is the, fa is, uh, is the one that I said before. The bottom-up uh, proposes to the system to look at the red button because it's the, the main feature there and the top-down uh, can consolidate this behavior. Then the image appears, the bottom up is attracted by movement, so move there rapidly. The, the top down says, okay, this is good, so I will learn that, and this is as well. So uh, the system learns so fast because the bottom up proposes interesting, potentially interesting things in the world in this particular case. They are actually useful, and so they are consolidated by the top down. And uh, uh, also, the system becomes scientific ordering because if you have a series that Last for long, then you trigger a saccade and you get reward. Next time you see the stimulus, you immediately uh, move there. So, this is a simple explanation why the system becomes anticipatory. The children become anticipatory. Um, we also have another work showing, uh, I mean, investigating empirically, um, in particular focusing on uh, what is actually rewarding in the scene. Is it the, the appearance of the object or the fact that the, the image is novel and we? I have to look at you, I don't have time to explain it. Uh, so, passing to the last part of my presentation, how about time is it? Five minutes? Yeah, okay. Mm, so it's 30, right? No. Okay. Uh, this is a new project, it's called uh, Go Robots, and good news for us, uh, we submitted this project several times, included it, and it was one of the 11 funded projects out of 800 projects of the last uh, future emerging technology uh, call, fact open call. So we're very happy for this new project and we can work on these issues for another four years. And uh, the, the team, uh, sorry, the consortium is formed by four teams. So myself, Kevin Olega, is here, Jochen Triesch, and uh, John Peters. And uh, as I mentioned before, my clever was based on this idea shared by the community. Uh, the new project is based on new idea because we realized that this mechanism doesn't work much. It doesn't allow us to really get to open-ended learning. Okay? Mm, and the, the idea of the project, the 
new project that comes from psychology and previous experiments in computational uh, modeling and also I mean, developmental psychology tells us that goals are very important and they should be uh, put in between intrinsic motivations and skill learning. And um, this became actually the um, breakthrough that we proposed to this project and I'm going to show you uh, with a specific model how this idea works. So what are goals first? first uh, what I define goals? Goals are internal representation of a future state uh, that can drive action of the robot, for example, so that the, the actual world becomes similar to what the robot has in mind. Okay, that's my definition of that. Uh, the model I'm going to talk about so focuses on uh, uh, control of over-attention based on intrinsic motivation, but now there are goals between intrinsic motivations and uh, um, skill learning, in particular the self-generation of visual targets. So, uh, the setup is a moving camera, so there is no harm of looking around. So, we are back to the base contingency situation where if the system looks at some parts of the screen, some interesting events happen in the screen itself. And in particular, if the system, uh, there are six spheres, uh, if the system looks at the blue one, then there is a light that switches on here, for example. And if, there looks, if it looks to the red button, so but that sphere, there is another light that switches on. And then there is also a random light that appears once in a while, and this is to check if the system is uh, able of agency in a sense. So learn goals that it can cause, not goals that just appear by themselves, not events that appear by themselves. So here is the model, and it's very similar to the previous one. So there is a bottom-up component and a top-down component. The model is more biologically uh, constrained than the other ones, so the, the whole architecture is based on the idea of, of this famous paper from Nico Saga, so it has, uh, reproduces the superior polygus, the two components, and the Basaganga control of uh, top-down attention, and also the bottom-up control as before, but with, uh, with the difference... Okay. Uh, differently from before, we don't only have the bottom-up or top-down component learning on the basis of the task at hand, but also a system that manages the formation of goals. Okay, this, this one. Let's see how the system works at the main components. So, uh, as I said, the severe polygonus can generate a case, it's based on a winner equal competition, and the bottom-up suggests, uh, suggests uh, what to look at, and the inhibition of return mechanisms uh, avoids that the system looks for several times at the same place. And this is the only absolute reference uh, component uh, of the system. All the rest is uh, eye-centered, and this uh, adds biological possibility to the model. So all these maps that you see around are eye-centered. Uh, the top-down component uh, takes uh, preprocessing of the fovea input, and these are examples of receptive fields of the neurons that are inside that feed information to the top-down reinforcement learning component. Uh, for now, it's just a self-organizing map, but we, we could add any fancy, complicated uh, preprocessing of the FOIA input. And um, uh, the interesting bit is this self all self-generated part, and uh, a key idea of the model that we are also ex exploring in other models is the fact that the system Expose the goal, and when there is a change in the environment, then it co uh, this causes the formation of a goal. So there is this, this idea that what really counts for uh, children and robots when they learn autonomously is that they learn that with their action they can change the world. So a change in the world marks the formation of a goal. Which change, by the way, uh, first of all, changes that are novel, because if you already learn how to, to produce a certain effect, we don't want to focus that on that forever, so this change has to be normal. And uh, uh, so, in this particular situation, the, the goals are a representation of the change itself. So, if I look here and there is a light flickering here, uh, I mean, uh, the system encodes that uh, kind of effect as a goal. And so, here are, um, there are a couple of goals that are found on the, uh, the rest of the two. Um, lights that the system can uh, cause to go on. And uh, after a goal is, uh, is generated, the system focuses uh, to acquire the skill to produce it again and again. Where the skill is, um, wherever you are, you can uh, look 
redundancy at the bottom that uh, causes a certain effect to produce, to be a uh, certain effect to be caused, for example, a particular light going on. So the skill is the uh, skill of exploring the scene in order to produce, to, to look at the bottom and cause the particular uh, outcome to, to happen, where the outcome corresponds to your goal, the goal that you have in mind. Okay? So uh, the system, once it has created a goal, it focuses on learning this, uh, this uh, kind of skill. And uh, this particular model is engaged from learning that skill only when it has acquired the skill itself. So there's a strong focusing on what is that we have in the beginning. Uh, uh, just to show how it works, the, the system focuses on uh, different uh, events. And there are some internal uh, variables without the system. Yes, your, your skill is improving, so continue to engage with it. Or, uh, give away because the, this is something that you are not able to cause with your action, for example, the uh, random light appearing once in a while, and so this cannot become a, a potential goal for you. So, uh, abandon that, that uh, the engagement with that particular experience. And uh, I have to say that this focusing idea, this is a kind of bracket, uh, this focusing idea, we are abandoning that because uh, we run some empirical experiments with. Uh, monkeys and children, and we saw that mm, they do not focus in an autistic way on the same experience for too long. They mm, tend to explore different goals in clusters, then to pass one class, but they don't focus on the same goal for several times. So now we are changing the mechanism and we are substituting it with uh, a competition between the different goals based on the motivation uh, related to the fact that you are learning uh, a little bit or a lot to accomplish those goals. Um, last bit, uh, the reward for actually training the top-down component, the enforcement learning component, doesn't come from the intrinsic motivations, but from the matching. That's an important difference with previous models. So the skill learning is, is driven by matching, the matching signal. You have a goal in your mind, so you commit to accomplish that, and when the environment becomes the same as the representation of your goal, then you have a matching signal that, that tells the, the skill now you should learn. Okay, that's an important bit and change. And another uh, element here is that learning happens only if you are the agent of uh, the change. And I mean, in general, I mean, by agency, I mean the fact that the probability of an event is, uh, if you per perform an action, is higher than the probability of that event to happen if you don't perform that action. So that's a general idea. And here we implement it with um, uh, a continuity in time of the contingency. So the fact that you have a saccade and then actually the right light uh, happens immediately, or the blue light happens after some time, and if there is a random event that happens after, uh, a long time after erection, then it don't turn out. So uh, we capture this idea of agency with contingency in time between action and outcomes. And uh, after the system has learned, and the system learns to these two speeds of pressing the buttons because the lights to go on, uh, we can, you know, by from outside, we can go inside the system, activate this goal or that goal, and the system will immediately recall the skill to, to accomplish that goal. For example, I activate the goal number 30 from outside, and the system will recall the skill of looking at the button that causes that light to switch on, and so for the other goal. So for now, the, the, we activate goals from outside, but in the future, the system will be autonomous in recording the goals and hence the skill. Uh, I go to the conclusion of my presentation, and uh, first I take a conclusion uh, about the specific model. Um, change plus novelty of these intrinsic motivations can support the self-generation of goals. Competence-based intrinsic motivations are important to decide which species to engage with. So once you have formed the goals, uh, which ones you should do. Yeah. Uh, goals are very important for several reasons, so they are becoming the pivot, pivot of our architectures for self-generating tasks, design which learning experience to engage with, guide learning uh, based on matching and exploiting sensory model knowledge once you have acquired that. And um, uh, okay, that's not so important. Final conclusions, open-ended learning requires sophisticated architectures, but the good news is that there are some principles that are, we see that there are some principles emerging in our models and those uh, and uh, different intrinsic mechanisms can, should play different roles in these architectures. And goals are pivotal for this architecture. And uh, if you study attention bottom up, top down interaction 
it's fundamental to explain all types of phenomena. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. 